No, that's completely wrong. This, this whole idea of event over character, first of all, is a false dichotomy because events come about because of characters acting and, and characters exist because events happen to them. And it's a false dichotomy. And nothing is interesting to us unless it has that human element in it. Um, we're addicted to stories because we want to see what the other person would do in that situation and imagine what we would do in that situation. And in fact, fiction and literature is completely character driven. And, if, and this, this notion of Cards is, uh, is ideological in that he wants to attack a certain kind of fiction that pays more attention to character than, than he would like. And I find this prescribing to other science fiction writers, like in this introduction that he wrote, telling other science fiction writers what they should write and how they should do it, I, I find it offensive and uh, an imposition on my freedom. I say, look, you, you make your own decisions on what science fiction should be and write them up, but don't be telling me what kind of science fiction I should be writing. I'll make that decision myself. So uh, the introductions in that volume I found to be very... Um, condescending and proprietarial. They essentially were trying to shape other people's careers to fit a pattern that would prove Card's own theories about uh, fiction. And I don't like my career being used in that way. I would say practically every sentence in that introduction to my own story is, is I would disagree with strongly in one way or another. Does Card follow his own advice? I don't think so, no. I think, in fact, he is a, what power there is in Card's fiction is to make you care intensely about these uh, disabled, uh, slam-type figures that he writes about again and again. Yeah. And uh, his, his enormous popularity has exactly to do with making people interested in these human beings that he writes about. And, in fact, his ideas are confused and unoriginal. Uh, they aren't his strength at all. So, no, he doesn't write according to his own theory either. It's just a, it's a method for uh, attacking and appropriating other, other writers' work. I don't, I don't like it. Whether or not you agree with all of Card's opinions, you're sure to find some useful information in his books, How to Write Science Fiction and Fantasy, and Characters and Viewpoint. I called Card, but his wife said he won't talk to TV people. I suggested he give primacy to the event over my character, but no go. Anyway, Future on Fire really is the best of the best. It includes Pat Murphy's Rachel in Love, Connie Willis's All My Darling Daughters, and James Patrick Kelly's Wrath. Another way to get feedback on your stories is a writer's group. It's like a self-help class in which everyone is both student and teacher. Other authors critique your work, and then you get a chance to hurt their feelings back. Anyway, to find a writer's group, call your local library or bookstore, or start your own. Years ago, Tanya Huff and several other speculative fiction writers in Toronto set up their own group, The Bunch of Seven. What are the pros and cons of writers' groups? Well, writers' groups are very good for writers when they're just starting out because, well, for two reasons. One, they give you support when you don't normally have it. Writing's a very lonely thing. You've all heard the, the stories about the writers sitting down, staring at the blank screen, sweating blood, and, and you just don't get any feedback. So a writer's group gives you instant feedback. It gives you some idea that you're not working in a vacuum. The other thing a writer's group gives you is discipline. It means you absolutely must have something done uh, once a month, once a week. Whenever your writer's group meets or they sneer at you and you begin to feel like a failure and eventually you quit and you don't write anymore and that's that. But, but if you're really serious about it and you, and you do, do the writing, you do the work every week, you get the feedback and you listen to it, eventually you progress to the point where writer's groups have outlived their usefulness because you realize that when it gets right down to it, that writer sitting alone at the screen, used to be the typewriter, <laughs> sitting alone facing the blank page is all there really is. And your opinion is the only opinion that matters. That, that their opinion, I know people in writers groups who somebody says, well, you know, I think this should be a why, and they change it, this should be a then, they change it. And they're so busy changing things that their vision is lost and it becomes a group vision. And I really don't think that's right. That you get to a point where writers groups just aren't useful anymore because you've outgrown them. For writers who have outgrown writers groups, SF author Damon Knight set up the Milford workshops, which ran from the mid-50s to the mid-80s and even spawned a British Milford. They were restricted to published authors, but in 1971, the Clarion workshops began to help aspiring writers. Clarion teachers have included Harlan Ellison, Ursula Le Guin, and Samuel Delaney. To find out how beneficial these workshops are, I called Ed Bryant. He's a graduate of both Milford and the very first Clarion. Uh, there are all sorts of writers' workshops around the country for aspiring writers. 
but uh, the premise of Milford is that everybody there is a working writer. And the value is not to get into knockdown, drag out ego battles, which would seem to be one, one possible shortcoming, but rather to be with your peers, whether they're less experienced or more experienced. And it's a, it's an, I hate to use the, the term, but it's a networking sort of thing where you are meeting other professionals. Uh, you become enthusiastic about what they're doing and their successes, and in turn that feeds back into your own work. And it's also, in the case of the Milford, it's a chance to bounce new, unsold, uh, oftentimes still in progress manuscripts off each other. And uh, to me, it's a tremendously, uh, uh, a tremendously valuable professional tool. How important was Milford for you? Well, it started me writing. Um, I met Harlan Ellison in the summer of 82, and he talked to Edward Bryant, who was running that summer's Milford, and, and one of the last Milford writing workshops that was held. And they allowed me in. I was the first non-professional ever to attend a Milford. And I'm quite sure that I would not be publishing and writing today if I hadn't had that experience, seven days of intense critiquing, workshopping. It's like, it really is almost a religious moment when you see the intensity that professional writers bring to their craft. And I've seen few places as intense as a Milford workshop. To be honest, the most value I ever got out of a Milford was the first one I went to. I took a terrible story along, which was rightly sort of trashed, and I learned nothing whatsoever about writing. But I was sitting next to two of the most preeminent critics um, in the field, and by the end of that Milford Writers' Conference, although I'd learned nothing about writing, I'd learned an awful lot about reading. I actually realized these guys read differently to the way I read. And that changed the way that I wrote. I started assuming that every word had meaning, every word had weight, every word was there for a purpose. And that is the way that I write. You will not find, well, you probably will find because I get sloppy and it's late at night and so on and so forth, but I don't, you know, if there is a word in my stuff, it's probably there for a reason. Neil Gaiman is best known for his comics, like The Sandman, where he has to choose his words and his pictures for a reason. Now, the comic industry is huge and it's growing, so there's a great need for stories that are well told. A few writers also illustrate their own comics, but most series are co-productions. Take this issue of Doom Patrol. Grant Morrison from Glasgow writes the story, couriers it to Ken Stacy of Victoria, B.C., who does the artwork, and then couriers it to John Workman in New Jersey, who letters the words and then couriers it across town to Dan Bozzo, who colors it, all under the supervision of editor Tom Payer in New York. So when someone asks, must I move to New York to earn a good living in comics, I say no. To make a good living in comics, work for a courier company. Comic book writing is much closer to screenplay writing, and Will Eisner's classic, Comics and Sequential Art, beautifully explains the possibilities of graphic storytelling. Also, comic industry magazines like the Comics Journal often reveal trade secrets in articles such as Alan Moore's essay on writing for comics. The best advice is always from those who do. It's very weird being put in the position of offering advice to young cartoonists. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's very strange, but there's an awful lot of people who want to do comics. And uh, you can't find a field where people are more sincere than any comics. And where there's more dedication and love to the, to the act of doing it, not to the deal, not to the meeting, but to the doing of it. The main thing I'd advise is to know what you want as thoroughly as possible. To find the thing that you've really got to put across. Um, and then to dedicate yourself to the actual craft of it. Learn what a flower looks like. Don't learn what a drawing of a flower looks like. Listen to how people talk. Don't read it from a comic book or hear it from a movie. And take whatever you've got and put it on the paper. And, and these days, it might even get published. 